everyday heroes. Heroes who do their bit to protect the environment can be found across the entire continent. We will introduce you to some of them in today's show. Welcome to a new edition of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinovio, coming to you from Kampala, the capital of Uganda. Thanks, Sandra. We begin in West Africa, Senegal to be precise, where we meet a man who's been fighting for the environment for 40 years as an activist, as a government minister, and now as the head of the country's reforestation agency. I'm Neo Taeg, we have the Conservation Foundation in Lagos. Also coming up, a young woman in Kenya uses flies to tackle waste and produce high protein food. And how villages in South Tyrol fight pesticides as their community. And how a community in Mozambique got the recycling bug. There are many across the continent who are giving their all for the environment. Today we meet one of them. This man, a former Senegalese environment minister, is dedicated to regreening the Sahel region, not just from his desk as a lobbyist, but on the ground. Together with local residents, he's been planting mangroves and other trees, even using rather unconventional methods at times. Senegal needs more trees, and Haida El Ali, who heads a large-scale reforestation project, is busy getting them planted. Scientists say that without major reforestation, Senegal will lose half its arable land within the next five years. Here on the coast of the Casamance region, farmland has become unusable due to salination. Mangroves that once protected the shoreline were cut down for firewood and building material. The farmers were desperate. Salt was encroaching into their rice fields, which were no longer producing rice. It was very difficult for them. But mangroves are a rich ecosystem. They hold back floodwaters, deter land erosion, and act as a natural salt barrier. They also store up to five times as much carbon dioxide as other trees. Once it became clear just how beneficial the mangroves are to farmers, things began to change. They were concerned about their rice fields, and they became heavily involved in planting mangroves because of their rice fields. Lala Dieme was one of them. For four years, villagers in Kanobo have been working to save their paddies. The initiative is organized and financed by the NGO Oceania. Haida El Ali served as its president for many years. Our rice fields no longer produce good harvests because salt water is invading them more and more. We now know the reason. It's because the mangroves have disappeared. We need to replant them. Luckily, Oceanium provides us with mangrove buds. Further north, in the extremely arid Matam region close to the Sahara Desert, El Ali came up with a more unconventional method. During the wet season, nomads' heads graze here. The animals have been recruited to help plant a forest. It will be part of the Great Green Wall that aims to curtail desertification of the Sahel region. The head is fed the fruits of the prosopis, a fast-growing tree that needs little water. The animals spread the seeds in their dung. We are going to try this all across Senegal, and we hope that in a year or two, we'll find prosopis growing alongside livestock grazing routes in Senegal. Back to Casamance, the Kaya Senegalensis, or African mahogany as it's commonly known, has become rare here. There are also very few wild animals left to spread the seeds. Without the animals, it was necessary to think of an alternative way to disseminate the seeds. I don't wait for things to solve themselves. I am a man of action, and I needed an affordable solution. Working within certain constraints does allow me some freedom. As soon as I find a solution, I apply it and move forward. And this is his solution here. Young men from the village of Osuye use slings to scatter seeds of the African mahogany. 
The intention is to introduce more species diversity. We are doing it here because in this area there is basically one type of tree, the neokaya. We are trying to encourage the growth of other trees like the baobab, kaya, senegalensis and jujuba. But it's the mangroves that are particularly dear to lifelong ecologist Haida El Ali's heart. Due to his efforts, over 150 million birds have already been planted. In a few years' time, Kanobos rice paddies should be sold free. When the Great Green Wall is completed, it will be the biggest man-made garden on earth, improving the environment tree by tree. But it's not just mega projects like this one that are important. Smaller individual initiatives can help too. And those are the ones we love to showcase on our Doing Your Bit segment. This time, coming to you right from here in Nigeria. Let's take a look. This is not a face mask to keep out the coronavirus. It's a piece of art. This woman is made of old textiles, but looks like a queen of flowers. Nigerian artist Marcelina Akpokjotor gets her material from tailors in Lagos. Mostly, it's discarded fabric swatches. Sometimes these tailors are likely to just burn them or throw them into the running waters. But because I go there, and they have someone who collects them, so they are also keeping it, and the environment is safe. Instead of throwing them away, I'm repurposing them. On average worldwide, one garbage truck full of clothes ends up in a landfill or in an incinerator each second. With her art, Masalina Akpojotor is giving cloth a second life, while at the same time making a living. Her works have even sold for as much as $25,000. Recycling has rarely been so practical and beautiful. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Wonderful works of art and what a way to use fabric scraps. Now we head to Europe, to a beautiful spot in the Italian Alps. It's one of the continent's biggest apple growing region. That is true Niota, but it has also become a battleground in the small community there as a farmers lock horns over one of the most fundamental questions in farming today. Should pesticides be used or not? Our Eco Africa reporter went to hear both sides of the argument. Substances that sow division. In Italy's alpine valleys, pesticides are in widespread use a fact that has angered some locals and sparked a heated debate between conventional and organic farmers. Take fluazinum. It says on the packaging that it can harm unborn children in the womb. Just imagine, this sort of product is doing the rounds. Those most at risk would be us, the fruit farmers. We're the ones who handle this stuff in its concentrated form. Once it lands in the sprayer, it's been diluted by a factor of a thousand. The village of Mars is located in one of Europe's most picturesque landscapes. In recent times, the local pharmacy has become the center point of research into the presence of pesticides in the air. Back in 2018, an independent environmental institute set up two measuring devices in the pharmacist's garden. The air was monitored for six months. Although the closest fruit farm is about a kilometer away, several pesticides were detected in the air. This is a small garden surrounded by hedges right in the middle of a village with many houses. There is a big tree which is supposed to offer protection, but here too, more than 25 pesticides have been detected. At present, there aren't many orchards located near the village. Many locals want to see the landscape maintain its diversity. 
It's a different story further down the valley where orchards dominate the landscape. One in 10 apples in Europe are grown in the region of South Tyrol. Six times more pesticides than is average in farming in Italy are sprayed on these monocultures. Raimund Proga is an apple farmer. He prefers to use terms like plant protection over pesticide. Growing fruit without plant protection products is nearly impossible at the moment. Conventional farmers do their thing, they have their means, and the organic farmers have theirs, but both kinds require plant protection. Nestled between the orchards is Orban Gluderer's organic herb farm. He's previously been banned from selling his produce because it contained pesticides. Now he's invested heavily in foil coverings to protect his plants. The air here contains a cocktail of contamination. We're not just breathing one substance in. Nobody knows what happens inside the body when we breathe in this cocktail of substances. The local farmers' association says the situation has improved. Conventional farmers now have to plant protective hedges if they border on organic farms or set up nets which are supposed to stop the spread of pesticides. Small steps of this kind are going some way towards easing tensions, but the widespread use of pesticides appears to be here to stay. I can't really comment on the health risks. What we always say is that the substances have been tested and approved by the health ministry. All the stuff that was sprayed 10, 20 years ago has now been banned. At the time, they were allowed, and I'm convinced that the substances allowed today won't be allowed in a few years. Both the former mayor and the pharmacist have set the ball rolling and are continuing the fight for organic farming to become the norm in and around Mars. In a local referendum in 2014, two-thirds of the villagers voted to ban pesticide use. The village also declared itself Europe's first pesticide-free community. The Farmers Association took the matter to court. Several years later, the courts accepted the result of the referendum. But the fight over the use of pesticides continues. Pharmacist Johannes Fragner unter Pertinger refers to a UN report that described the necessity for pesticides as a myth. It literally says the assertion by the agrochemical industry that pesticides are necessary is not only inaccurate but dangerously misleading. And then this push came from Mars. It came at us like thunder. We are in donor. Many conventional farmers are concerned about the future of their businesses. The case has now reached the Supreme Court in Rome, which will decide whether or not pesticides should be allowed in the region. Apple production is clearly important in northern Italy. In Ivory Coast, it is growing cocoa. In fact, the West African country is the world's biggest producer of the cocoa beans. But those beans are exported and processed overseas. Little of the profit goes to the local farmers and even less to their wives. In Abode, in the south of the country, a women's cooperative has set out to do things differently and they're reaping incredible results in terms of the environment too. Typically considered the domain of men, there used to be no role in the cocoa harvest for these women. But now, they're farming and producing themselves. Juliette Kouassi founded a cooperative with women in her home village in the southern part of Ivory Coast. Its aim is to produce cocoa beans more sustainably and to use them for making more than just chocolate. Nothing is thrown away. We start with the mucilage, the sticky pulp, which is never used in cocoa production. We add flavors and spices to it, which is unusual and innovative. The women use the juice from the pulp to make products such as flavored cocoa beans and the husks to make tea. The 40 local women who have joined the cooperative are now earning an income for themselves and their families. 
I used to only work occasionally. I didn't make much money. But since I joined the cooperative, that's changed. I can earn the equivalent of four euros fifty every day. I'm happy because thanks to the cooperative, I'm now independent. The majority of Ivory Coast's 26 million population work in the agricultural sector. 40% of the world's cocoa comes from the West African country. Every year, around 25 million tons of shells and bean husks end up in garbage dumps or are burned. Producing more goods from ponds is good for the environment and enables families in the village to earn more from their harvests. I believe we need to increase the value of our cocoa to give it more credibility overall. With my approach, it is the women who are involved in this aspect. Their inclusion will make a real difference here. They will improve the cocoa value chain, something that until now was the province of men. Julia Kouassi is making a delivery to a small shop in Abidjan that sells the cooperative's products. The flavored cocoa beans, spice mixes and tea. The German development agency GIZ helped to establish the contact. Among the organization's activities is supporting sustainable initiatives to secure farmers' livelihoods across Africa. She can be a role model for other women when it comes to expanding their cocoa processing and developing new products. Juliette Kouassi has an apartment in Abidjan. In the kitchen, she cooks up her products and experiments with new ideas. Inspiration strikes when I'm in my kitchen. When I start one recipe, an idea for another one pops into my head. I don't know why, it just comes naturally. And Juliet Kwasi's idea of getting more from cocoa ponds is catching on. The Ivory Coast government is in the process of building a biomass power generation plant that will turn the country's abundance of cocoa production waste into electricity. Another young woman who has built up a solid agribusiness company is featured in our next report. Talash Yumbas set up a somewhat unusual farm near Nairobi. It breeds flies. Flies. These insects aren't very popular with us humans, but Talash is showing that the black soldier fly, in fact, deserves some respect. This container is full of black soldier fly larvae. Many might find them disgusting, but for Talash Hybers, they were the basis of a business idea she had two years ago. We think Insectipro is a company of the future because we are where sustainability and profitability meet. And more importantly, we see the beauty within the beast, and I think you should too. And that beauty lies in the larvae loving garbage and feasting on organic waste. What goes in one end comes out the other as nutrient-rich fertilizer. Farmer Douglas Njoroge has been using it on his fields. He says the quality of the soil has improved and that using the fertilizer has financial advantages as well. It also helps in, the, in reducing the production cost because what happens is that the crops grow healthy and very fast. So opportunist insects and uh, diseases are not given a chance. The less they stay in the farm, the growing period, the cheaper it will be for, for the farmer. Kenya's capital Nairobi generates about 3,000 tons of waste every day. 60% of it is organic, such as spoiled produce from markets. When it rots, it emits greenhouse gases such as methane. The insect farm in nearby Limuru can take about 20 to 30 tons of that daily organic waste. After the gluttonous soldier fly larvae have gorged themselves until they are nice and plump, they are dried and ground into a high protein powder that can be fed to chickens or pigs. It's more environmentally friendly than fish meal production, which is a significant contributor to overfishing. And there's another reason why interest in the insect-based feed has grown during the current coronavirus pandemic.
When the borders were blocked off, they stopped bringing in fish meal into the country. Fish meal is our main competitive product, so Tanzania and Uganda withheld or it took longer to cross the border, meaning that the demand for black soldier flies went up because black soldier flies are an alternative to fish meal. The company employs about 60 people. For some, it's provided an unexpected career opportunity. Well, all this is about passion. I didn't study this. Myself, I did education. Yeah, but now I'm this, in this field, mostly because of, I think it's passion, and just that uh, fulfillment that you get uh, working with love is warmth. I mean, it's fascinating. Talash Hybers, who studied international food and agribusiness, has already expanded operations and now also raises crickets. Nutritious and delicious, they won't just be feed for animals, but humans too. Yet more proof that we should think more highly of the insects. In fact, these creatures can be our six elect friends, helping us to save resources and dispose of waste, but not, unfortunately, plastic waste. That's right, Sandra. It's a man-made problem that we humans have to deal with ourselves. And there are many and more projects and people in Africa doing just that. One association in Mozambique doesn't just collect used plastic, it also promotes recycling, involving schools, local communities, professional waste collectors and even artists. Let's see how far they've come. Patrizia Gaspa and her family live in Beira. Collecting plastic waste is how she makes a living. Patrizia is one of around 100 waste collectors working for two recycling associations in Beda. Every day they take what they've collected to the women's NGO Anzatu. The group's aim is to provide both practical assistance for women and protect the environment. Paulina Nakena is the president and has led the organization since it was established in 2013. Yeah. This is an association focusing on women with low incomes. So what we do is basically focus on recycling. That not only gives the women an income, but also helps to keep our city cleaner. Together, the women manage to gather around 1.5 tons of waste every month. At the recycling center, workers sort and package it ready for transport. After that, it gets sent to an industrial recycling plant for processing. This community used to be very dirty with all the plastic waste. Now I see a real difference in terms of cleanliness. But that means you don't find much waste in this area anymore. So the collectors have to go further to find material for recycling, as there's no longer enough around here. The group Anzatu is part of the Mozambique Association of Recycling, or AMOR. The association is working to set up an efficient waste management and recycling system in Mozambique. So far, six regional organizations are taking part, and more have signaled interest in joining. When AMOR started in 2009, the concept was new in the Southeast African country. Now, 10 years down the line, the attitude towards waste has changed. Amor has changed a lot here. Since they started their activities in Mozambique, they've brought a whole new perspective as regards recycling. And they've also introduced new infrastructure. Before, we had huge amounts of plastic waste, but we didn't know what to do with it or how to process it. Three R Recycling is one of the private companies that also profit from the growing interest in recycling. They sell on the sorted materials to local companies, who transform them into furniture and many other useful items. Amor says that between four and six hundred tons of waste are being recycled every month. That might sound like a lot, but it's actually only the equivalent of 2% of the overall waste produced in Mozambique. So there's still a long way to go to make effective waste management a reality on a large scale. If we want to reduce the amount of plastic in circulation, 
we have to recycle it and cut down the amount we use in first place. Here at Eco Africa, we have plenty of ideas about how that can be done. Join us next time for more green ideas and initiatives. But for now, it's goodbye from the Conservation Foundation Lagos. See you next week. Till then, Neota, it is a time for me to say goodbye as well. But one last thing, please stay in touch and visit us on our social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. I am Sandra Twinovdia and I'll be looking forward to seeing you once again very soon. Mm -hmm.